Hey guys, welcome back to the, uh, the last lecture of Mod 170, Chapter 1932, Vibration and Noise Diagnosis and Correction. This is a short lecture, it shouldn't take too long, it's only about 20 slides. So it's going to be mostly about just to help diagnose certain issues that come across um, with differential drivetrain and transmissions. And a lot of things that be, can be misconstrued as a issue regarding the transmission. It could be something else. Um, so let's go ahead and go over it a little bit. So figure 132.1, many vehicles, especially those equipped with four cylinder engines, use a dampener weight attached to the exhaust system or differential as shown to dampen out certain frequency vibrations. The reason why they say for most four cylinder engines is because the design of the four cylinder engine causes a lot of vibration. If you guys have ever, have ever driven a vehicle with a four cylinder engine, it just kind of shakes and vibrates a lot more than say a V8 or a V6 or even an inline six. For some reason though, it's just four cylinder engines love to vibrate. So we need to be able to absorb those vibrations of that energy. So we actually have a vibration dampener here that uh, helps absorb. It's got rubber dampers inside, helps absorb a lot of that vibration, especially or I'll say as well as um, dampers in the exhaust. Oh, my clicker broke. Yeah, my clicker broke. All right, hold on. So the exhaust was found to be rubbing on the frame rail during a visual inspection. Rubber exhaust system hangers are used to isolate noise and vibration from the exhaust system from entering the interior. These rubber supports can fail, causing the exhaust system to be out of proper location and was found to be looking for evidence of witness work. So you can see the exhaust has actually been rubbing for a while on the frame. The rubber hangers they're talking about not, aren't only there to help absorb the vibration and keep it from getting into the cab, they're there also to help allow the engine in the, or the exhaust to move because the engine is actually mounted on rubber mounts as well. So it needs to have some flexibility. You can't have it solid mounted or you know, uh, the torque will actually cause, say, uh, bolts or the vibration to transfer through. It's there to help absorb impact as well. And when those rubber mounts fail, then the exhaust will start to hang lower than it should, so it might rub on the ground more, if, especially if your car is lower, it goes um, And also um, cause it to rub against other parts as well along the frame. So this is a chart showing typical vehicle engine speeds at which various components will create a noise or vibration under what conditions. I'm not going to go over everything, you guys probably can't even read it from the video, but uh, this is, I'm pretty sure this is going to be inside your guys' actual um, book. And it'll give you, it's a good breakdown to show what, um, what kind of scenarios you can come across and what kind of issues and or what kind of diagnosis of why it's actually bad and then at what speed. So it goes from zero to 70 miles an hour and then vehicle speed, um, or vehicle speed miles per hour, and then what kind of issue you're actually having. So if you have uneven tire wear, it usually happens between say 25 and 70 or maybe even faster. Uh, tire balance problem, you know, it focuses. So you're gonna have issues where it'll pop up and then where the, the noise and the vibration actually disappears. So this is actually good information to have. Um, I take a screenshot of this and maybe even print it, and, you know, keep that uh, on your guys' toolbox just so it can help you, you know, uh, kind of further diagnose an issue with the car. Vibration created at one point is easily transferred to the passenger compartment. The increased stress suspensions are more sensitive to tire imbalance than short long arm type suspension kits. So the increased stress here, because of the tire bouncing up and down, it's more prone to actually sending that vibration through the rest of the steering and into the steering wheel. And then that's where more, most customers are gonna feel it. They're gonna feel it in their steering wheel when they say, oh, I'm driving down the road, my steering wheel starts shaking like crazy. Now, if it's obviously under acceleration or on a bumpy road, then you know that that'd be something to do with either the McPherson strut or even the strut rod that comes into the lower control arm. If they feel it, the vibration of shaking under braking, then you know you have an issue with the brake rotors or the brake pads. Hertz means cycles per second. If six cycles occur in one second, then the frequency is six hertz. And amplitude refers to the total movement of vibrating component. So the hertz of the, the vibration that they're trying, they're trying to basically break down is the severity of the vibration. So if you have something that's 
six hertz, obviously it's gonna be vibrating a heck of a lot more than something that's only two hertz, which means two vibrations per second or two fluctuations. Uh, sorry, two cycles. So obviously something with more vibration, you're gonna have more hertz or you're gonna have more of a signal being sent out from the vibration that's actually happening. Every time the end of a clamped yardstick moves up and down is one cycle. The number of cycles divided by time equals the frequency. If the yardstick moves up and down 10 times or 10 cycles in two seconds, the frequency is five hertz, 10 divided by two is five. So this is actually a fun little demonstration. If you guys want, grab a, if you're at home, grab a ruler and hold it at one end and flip the ruler. And when you flip the ruler, you hear it kind of by the and then slide the ruler up because of the, you're changing the length of the stick, that's at, the portion that's sticking out of the table, you'll actually hear the frequency increase. It'll start to as you slide the yardstick or the yardstick or the ruler up. And then try it the opposite way, try and bounce it and then slide it back down. You hear the frequency start to lower. Determining the rolling circumference of a tire. So the rolling circumference of a tire, what you want to do is you want to make a mark on the tire and on the actual pavement, roll it around to where it goes one full rotation back to uh, the dot face pointed to the ground. Then you're going to measure from here to here. So for this tire, just a quick demonstration, as it rolled around, came back down, it was a total of 77 inches. An electronic vibration analyzer, I've actually never used one of these. Um, this is, you know, it's a good, uh, good tool to use to measure vibrations, you know, for for higher, I would say higher class cars, cars that aren't meant to be vibrating or shaking so much. Um, I couldn't tell you if there's actual additional sensors because like I said, I've never actually used one of these, but obviously some shops may have it, especially if it's a suspension shop. Properly balancing all wheels and tires solves most low frequency vibrations. You're gonna get a lot of issues where a vehicle has bald tires or old tires and the vibrations get thrown off on them. Or if they had them dismounted off the rim and then they put it back on, but they don't rebalance them. Now that can throw off how the tires actually balance on the rim, which then will cause a, a wheel hop. That wheel hop is gonna start etching into the tire. It's gonna give you what is known as cupping. That cupping is basically can't be remedied after that. Once it's gotten too bad where there's major cupping on the tire, the tire has to be replaced. So even if you balance it, you're still gonna have an outer roundness in the tire, and the problem's pretty much not going to go away because of the tire actually being bad. An out of balance tire showing scalloped or bald spots around the tire, even if correctly balanced, this cup tire would create a vibration. So even though the tire, like I said, even though the vibration or the balance thing was fixed, doesn't necessarily mean that the tire is good anymore. The tire just has to be replaced, and you're going to see it's more common with big tires like this because of the large knobs that are on the actual tire. They take big chunks out and eventually you got flat spots on it and the tire is just gonna shake and bounce. Another cause of a wheel vibration that is often blamed on wheels is a bent bearing hub. Use a dial indicator to check the flange for run out. So you're gonna put the bearing hub on a vise and you're gonna rotate it. You're gonna make sure that the dial indicator is on a nice flat surface. Make sure you know it's nice and smooth. And as you rotate, you're gonna watch it fluctuate. If it's fluctuating, then you know you have a bent flange. And what is that flange bolted to? Or what, what bolts to that flange? Correct, is the tire or the wheel. So as the wheel rolls, it's gonna to start to do this. It's gonna give you the same issue as a vibration or an out of balance wheel. Well, out of balance wheel. Checking a dry shaft for runout using a magnetic mounted dial indicator. So that you're gonna go ahead and put this, I usually put it on the frame, somewhere nice and sturdy and flat have the car in the air, rotate dry shaft. As the dry shaft rotates, you can see the fluctuation in the dial. If you have a fluctuation in the dial, then you know that the actual indicator, or you know that the dry shaft is actually bent due to the fact of the indicator fluctuating so much. When checking the out of balance of a dry shaft, make reference marks around the shaft so that the location of the imbalance may be viewed when using a strobe light. So as it's rotating, you're gonna know where that imbalance is. Now, the Upside to having this is if you do have an out of balance dry shaft, say one of the weights fell off or just through time it's got out of balance, you can actually take the dry shaft to a dry shaft shop or a drive line shop and actually have them either rebalance it or rebuild the entire dry shaft itself to make sure that the dry shaft isn't damaged or isn't um, out of balance anymore. 
Using a stroke balancer to check the drive line vibration requires that an extension be used on the magnetic sensor. Tall safety stands are used to support the rear axle to keep the drive shaft angle the same as when the vehicle is on the road. So what you have to do is you have to get the vehicle on the, the, the pole jacks, make sure that it's sitting at ride height because remember what happens if suspension goes up and down? This drive line angle is gonna change. So we have to make sure that we're at factory drive line, that angle as if we're driving down the road. Typical procedure to balance the drive shaft using hose clamps. Determine the point of imbalance. Add clamps 180 degrees from the point of imbalance until they become a heavy, the heavy spot. Rotate two clamps equally away from each other until the best balance is achieved. I've actually never done this before. Um, I couldn't say uh, how accurate or how well this actually works. But if you want to do things right, obviously send it to a driveline shop. Or if you guys have a drive shaft balancer at the shop, go ahead and do it that way. Two clamps are required to balance this front drive shaft of a four-wheel drive vehicle. Be careful when using hose clamps so that the ends of the clamps do not interfere with the body or other parts of the vehicle. So in some vehicles, you have very tight clearances around the drive shaft. Make sure nothing's sticking out after the hose clamp. You know you have excess going out the other side. If anything, you're gonna have to cut that piece off because if it's big, long enough and hanging out, it'll start wrapping against the side of the either the transmission, the drive shaft tunnel or anything that's around it. Tire wear caused by improper alignment or driving habits such as high speed cornering can create tire noise. Notice the feathered edge outer tread blocks. So the feathering is due to um, basically just driving the hell out of the car. Now, is there a real a way to actually fix the tire? No. Is there a way to help prevent this? Yes. Don't drive the car so hard, especially with truck tires like this. These aren't made to handle, like say an Audi or a Lamborghini. These are mud tires, these are all-terrain tires, these are for rocks and everything. They're gonna get chewed up, especially on uh, pavement. This bearing was found on a vehicle that had been stored over the winter. The, this corroded bearing produced a lot of noise and had to be replaced. So what does rust do to metal as it sits there? Or what does water do to metal as it sits there? It rusts. What does rust do to the metal? It eats away at it. So it's gonna to start to chew away at this. So this it looks like it's corrosion on the top. This is actually corrosion into the actual bearing. So now, this bearing is no good. You're gonna feel that grinding and rubbing and it's gonna sound like a growling noise. So we wanna go ahead and replace this, uh, this wheel bearing, um, especially if it's been sitting for a long time. And more likely, if this one's sitting, if it's in like a long time of doing this, more likely the other side's gonna be doing the same thing. So you wanna replace uh, bearings as a set, you know, the front axle and you wanna re replace them as the rear axle. Chassis ear microphones attached to the various suspension components using an integral clamp. The sound is transmitted wirelessly to the receiver inside the vehicle where a system technician can listen for noises and the vehicle is being driven. This is actually pretty cool. These little guys here send a signal to a control box and the guy's got headphones on and he can actually pinpoint and send like, okay, this is number one, two, three, and four. He can change the channel, basically listen to what this one's doing, listen to what this one's doing, listen to what this one's doing, and listen to what that one's doing, so he can pinpoint which part is actually bad. So, in conclusion, there's so many things, or so many possibilities of something that can be wrong, especially with vibrations, with um, damage, growling, and it's really, your knowledge on how to diagnose is what's gonna help you figure out to do it correctly. And also to make sure that you don't misdiagnose and you have to replace something and then find out that that wasn't the problem. I've seen it a lot with um, especially suspension parts um, where they replaced one thing but it actually turned out to be something else and you know they didn't balance the tires or they replaced all the tie rod ends and it could be a number of things. So it's just for proper diagnosis. You know, definitely use that lookup chart that's on this chapter. It'll help you diagnose without actually shooting yourself in the foot later on. And then the customer will think that you're shotgunning parts. Shotgunning parts, if you've ever seen a shotgun, you know, it doesn't shoot just, it could shoot just one giant bullet, but it shoots a bunch and just hopes that you hit something. This is pretty much the same way, meaning that you just fire a bunch of parts at it and say, hopefully it fixes it. When in reality, it could have been one part that you have to had to replace. Instead, you charge a customer $800 to fix something that could have cost $100. So if you guys have any questions, let me know. Um, I do want to get another Zoom uh, 
a Zoom conference going soon, so um, I will let you guys know when that's going to happen, all right? All right, you guys, have a good one.